Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Record of Arms. I'm your host, Mark Seven. I'm glad to be back with you again for another talk about military history. Since we talked last, I've been on vacation with the lovely Mrs. Seven in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. We hiked a total of 26 miles, we climbed to the summits of two mountains, and we were thoroughly drenched with rain on both of those hikes. We also saw no less than five bears in the wild, bringing our entire lifetime total to 12. Luckily, these were all seen through good binoculars at something like 5,000 meters range, which is how I prefer to experience bears. This left me thoroughly refreshed and ready to continue with our conclusion to the examination of the 1939 campaign in Poland. I've been working from the same U.S. Army study that I've been using for the previous episodes. This is titled The German Campaign in Poland, 1939. It was written by Major Robert M. Kennedy and was published in April of 1956. We left off with the accomplishment by the Wehrmacht's army groups of the objectives of the initial phase of their plan of conquest. The German invasion force was organized into two major army groups, one in the north and one in the south. Army Group North was commanded by Fedor von Bock and consisted of 4th Army and 3rd Army. The largest concentration of mechanized forces in the north was 19 Corps, consisting of the 3rd Panzer and the 2nd and 20th Motorized Infantry Divisions. Before the attack was launched, these were to be joined by the newly raised 10th Panzer, which was initially retained in the Army Group Reserve, but would eventually be joined to the 19th Corps. These troops had begun the campaign based in Pomerania and East Prussia respectively, and the initial objective of their attack was to cut the arm of Polish territory separating the main portion of German territory from the isolated province of East Prussia. This strip of ex-German territory, known as the Polish Corridor, had been included in the new Polish Republic as part of the territorial settlements following the First World War. It was given to the Poles to provide them with an outlet to the sea, and the short stretch of the Baltic coast it gave to Poland included the ports of Gdynia and Gila, the chief bases of the small Polish navy. The major port of Danzig, or Gdansk as it was called in Polish, was declared a free city and controlled by neither nation. The Poles were guaranteed rights to its harbor. In the first phase of the German attack, Army Group North had advanced from both frontiers and made contact at the base of the corridor, shattering the Polish Pomorza army. Third and fourth armies made contact along the Vistula near Grudziatz, but the city of Danzig was seized by German reservists present in the city with the assistance of air and naval units. While following units of 4th Army began to clear the rest of the corridor of Polish troops and press those remaining into an enclave along the Baltic coast, other elements of 3rd Army moved south from Pr East Prussia in the direction of the capital. Here they ran into Polish troops of the Modlin Army, which held the heavily fortified zone of Malawa. German attack was held up here until probing mobile units located weak points in the Polish front. Mechanized forces broke through the defenses near Malawa and threatened the defenders with envelopment, forcing a retreat, and allowing 3rd Army to move past the area. Some of the German troops moved to join those assaulting Grudziats, while others prepared to continue the move on Warsaw from the north. Meanwhile in the south, the major concentration of German forces was embodied in the organization of Army Group South, commanded by General Gerd von Rundstedt. This consisted of three armies, deployed in a line north-south along the Polish-Silesian frontier and with some elements facing north around the corner of the Polish frontier from Slovakia. The northernmost was 8th Army, force of four infantry divisions intended to defend the army group's right flank. Main forces were concentrated in 10th Army, which was deployed in the center of the group's sector. This consisted of four corps. The most important of these was the 16th, the armored spearhead of the 10th Army, under General Hopner. This included the 1st and 4th Panzer Divisions. 10th Army was intended to undertake the main drive on Warsaw from the southeast across the central Polish plain. Further south, 14th Army was deployed, another powerful force including the 5th and 2nd Panzer Divisions. The 14th was to make an assault on the southwestern portion of Polish territory, which included the important industrial center of Krakow and the bulk of her mineral resources. In the first phase of the invasion, these southern armies, facing the largest concentrations of Polish troops, had fought large-scale battles. In the center of the army's sector across the frontier was the fortified zone of Polish Silesia, which held up large German forces until the centers of resistance around Katowice and Czesiszowa were overcome. These efforts occupied the major part of 10th Army's forces, while 8th Army moved to the northeast on the army group's right flank, pushing towards the Pozna River and advancing on Lodz. This advance had the effect of pushing the Polish Lodz and Poznan armies apart. In the south, 14th Army units, advancing from southern Germany and across the Carpathians from Slovakia, pushed from both directions towards Krakow. Within days, the resistance in the frontier zones had been broken, and 10th Army pushed rapidly ahead. Soon they were across the Pilica River, the last natural obstacle between itself and the capital. 
Polish committed the bulk of their general reserves against this thrust, but had little success in slowing it down. Similar advance was taking place in the 14th Army sector. The fall of Krakow and the rapid advance of the Germans from the south and west had shattered the Polish resistance here, and compelled a precipitate withdrawal to the northeast in the direction of Lublin to avoid encirclement and destruction in Galicia. German successes were augmented greatly by their victory in the air. Polish Air Force, which was small but equipped with modern bombers and attack planes, was handicapped by its use of outdated fighters, which were no match for their Luftwaffe counterparts in the air. The Germans were able to put an end to effective Polish resistance in the air within a few days of the opening of the campaign. Polish fighters were eliminated from Polish skies everywhere except over Warsaw, where they continued to fly for a short while longer. The modern Polish bombers mounted repeated and valiant strikes against the oncoming German columns, but they were all but destroyed after less than a week of operations. Here and there, a handful of Polish planes, operating under local control and from improvised facilities, flew for a bit longer, but by and large the sky belonged with the Luftwaffe. The Germans used this air supremacy to keep the Polish forces in the field under constant surveillance, and to mount repeated bombing and close air support missions for the assistance of the ground advance. This constant and effective air support, which was available at short notice and controlled by Luftwaffe officers embedded in the advancing ground units, was instrumental in the destruction of Polish strongpoints and to the maintenance of the momentum of the advance. It was to become one of the hallmarks of the Blitzkrieg style of warfare, which was to yield the Wehrmacht most of its early successes. So now, let's get back into it as the retreating Poles attempt to regroup and put a halt to the German advances. The rapid advances of the Germans had thoroughly disrupted the Polish defense organization. Communications and coordination became increasingly problematic as larger and larger portions of the Polish army began retreating under the pressure of the possible German encirclement or were cut off altogether. Orders went out from Polish high command to reform the Polish units into three new armies. One of these was to assemble at the junction of the Vistula and Sand rivers and guard the approach to the capital, while the other two were to assemble to the north and south of this central force. The confusion caused by the rapidly changing situation was multiplied a thousandfold by the difficulties of communications between units and the frequent Luftwaffe attacks on the road and rail traffic. As a result, the planned regrouping of the Poles proved impossible to effect. Therefore, the retreat was carried out by the several Polish armies in an uncoordinated manner. In the north, the Posen army was being pushed to the east by elements of the German 3rd and 4th armies. As they fell back, they were joined or followed up by remnants of the shattered Promotza army that had escaped destruction in the corridor. In the region of the junction of the two German army groups, the Lotz army, which up to now had been relatively little engaged and was still in good order, was coming under heavy attack from the German 8th army in the vicinity of the city of Lodz, and was starting to withdraw towards the capital. The structure of the Polish surface transportation network would act on these forces to concentrate them in the area around Kutno. This town, on the main rail line running west from the capital, was situated on a piece of land between the Vistula River in the north and the Bezura, which branched off the Vistula to the south and curved around towards the west. If the river crossings were denied to the Poles gathering here in the open ground to the west occupied, they would be trapped. Further south, the 10th Army, driving on the capital, pushed the remaining elements of the shattered Krakow Army into the area of Radom, where they would be trapped between the Palika and a bend of the river Vistula. The geography here was similar to that of the emerging Kutno pocket, and in the same way the Poles concentrating here could be trapped and dealt with at leisure if the crossings of the Vistula to the east and to the Palika to the north could be held against them. The remaining Polish units in the south, those that had been posted south of the city of Krakow and facing the Carpathian border, were rapidly retreating into the area of the cities of Lublin and Lvov. Both of these cities were fortified. Lublin was to the east, on the other side of the Vistula, about 70 miles or 115 kilometers from Radom. Lvov was much further to the south and east, on the far side of the River Sand. Closely pursuing the Poles were the mechanized forces of the 14th Army aiming to cut off their retreat if possible and force them into another encirclement. In most sectors of the German advance, the fast-moving mechanized forces, supported by close air support aircraft and introduction strikes by the Luftwaffe medium bombers, broke up the enemy's lines. Such breakthroughs compelled the defenders to withdraw or risk encirclement. The rapidity of this advance had thoroughly hamstrung the Polish defense scheme and compelled large sections of their armies to spend most of the campaign in a continual withdrawal eastwards. Those that chose to hold out would be left with German artillery supported infantry formations, following behind the mechanized divisions, to deal with. By this method, large portions of the Polish army had been isolated, reduced to comparative impotence, and compelled to surrender or die. The scheme of fast-paced combined arms operations was intensified in the second phase of the German conquest. 
Wehrmacht now moved to capitalize on the chaos of the Polish withdrawal and press their advantage. Their objective now was the total destruction of the Polish forces in the field. With the organization of the Polish forces in disarray, the threat of counterattack on the open flanks of the rapidly moving mechanized forces could be realistically discounted. This enabled the panzers and other mechanized troops to push much further ahead of the supporting infantry than would have been safe against a more intact and organized foe. This freedom of maneuver was augmented by the total dominance the Germans had achieved in the air, which allowed them to not only strike the Poles with relative impunity, but also to keep their every move under close observation. The conditions were perfect for a battle of annihilation, in which the remaining Polish armies could be herded into hopeless positions, surrounded, and destroyed. But there was one very serious complication in the German strategic situation, however. The British and French had, after all, honored their pledges to the Poles and declared war on the 3rd of September. So far, this had brought little relief to the embattled Republic, as the German high command had widely chosen to leave the initiative in the west of the Allies, who had not made any rapid moves against them. However, the threat of an attack in the west hung over the entire enterprise and affected the planning of the German leadership. A major move by the Allies would require the movement of the bulk of the still relatively small Wehrmacht to be shifted into western Germany to deal with a new and much greater threat. A movement of many major units like this could not be quickly accomplished and could take weeks. As a result, the Army High Command viewed the fastest possible conclusion to the Polish campaign as imperative. The plan adopted, then, reflected an unwillingness to move further into Poland than was necessary to destroy her armies. It was adopted over the objection of Bach and Guderian, commanders of Army Group North and its armored components respectively, who favored a more extensive and aggressive pursuit of the Poles far into eastern Poland to prevent the escape of any of their troops into the Pripyat marshes of her eastern border regions. So let's look at what happened next. We'll start with Army Group North. When we left the Third Army, its 21st Corps had just taken the vital town of Grudziats at the base of the quarter. Violent actions continued to be fought in the city against scattered groups of Poles until the evening of the 4th. The bridges over the Vistula, located here, had been badly damaged in the fighting to take the city, German engineering units set to work repairing them. Meanwhile, 1st Corps and Corps Vodrig, and another sector of 3rd Army's front, finished mopping up operations in the Malawa area. The hard and costly battle here became the object of criticism among the Wehrmacht's senior officers, many of whom felt that the fortified area would have been better bypassed. In any case, little resistance was encountered by these two corps as they moved southwards. The commanders of these units expected the Poles to make a stand on the Nauru River, which was some distance to the east, and ran roughly north-south towards the fortress city of Modlin, and made preparations to meet a defensive line there. The other component of Army Group North, the 4th Army, was moving east in the southern portion of the corridor, and eliminated the remaining elements of the dismembered Pomoza Army that held out in the region west of the Vistula. The forward elements, including the mechanized 19th Corps under Heinz Guderian, reached the river at a point roughly halfway between Grudziaz and Bidgosysk, where the river turns and begins to run southeast, again towards Modlin, and approaches the border of the Army Group South Zone. From here they turn north to join up with the troops of 21 Corps, holding the latter town. Meanwhile, the infantry components of 4th Army march towards the river on a wide front directed towards the section of the Vistula running from the town of Nu in the north to a bend near Bidgosysk in the south. Fierce engagements were fought by these outfits south of Grudziaz. Some of these combats were against disorganized and isolated elements of Polish units overrun by the advance of the mechanized forces of 19 Corps. More serious fighting was had against the Polish 15th Infantry Division, which was forced out of its position at the base of the corridor and compelled to withdraw towards the east. Behind this first wave, the German 73rd and 208th Infantry Divisions crossed the River Oder and advanced behind the army. The reduction of these positions and the advance of 4th Army to the Vistula completed the operation of retaking and securing the corridor. With this done, Army Group North could move on to the next phase of its operations in the overall German strategy. This involved the transfer of the bulk of 4th Army to assembly areas in East Prussia. From here they would strike towards Lomza, a strong position on the narrow river not far from the East Prussian frontier. This new advance would be to the east of the 3rd Army, which was moving on the fortified city of Modlin, a short distance northwest of the capital, and was intended to protect and clear its eastern flank. Then the units of 4th Army would head south against Polish armies confronting their own left flank, and then turn west behind the forces opposing 3rd Army, cutting them off. The imperative of speed in this operation was reflected in the risks that would need to be run by removing so many troops from the corridor, where large numbers of Polish troops bypassed or overrun in the advance were still in the field. The Wehrmacht banked on the disorganization and demoralization of these units, who would for the time being be opposed only by second line and service units. This plan was the work of Bach, and reflected his assessment of the situation. 
On the night of the 4th, however, the plan was modified by Army High Command. In view of the dangerous situation in the West, they vetoed the concentration of 4th Army forces at Lomza, sending only a small contingent of troops already present in East Prussia to the area to act in an offensive role. The bulk of the 4th Army was directed instead to continue its march on the capital from its current positions in the corridor. The large eastern arm of the enveloping movement was reduced to only the panzer and mechanized troops of the 19th Corps, whose transfer to the eastern flank of 3rd Army was approved. Movement to the east was to be strictly limited, however, and the panzers kept west of a line running through the town of Ostromazowica, about 25 miles east of the capital on the main northeastern Wehr line. On the morning of the 5th, Bach called Brauschitz, the Army Supreme Commander, and pressed his case for the left flank of his army group to be strengthened. Brauschitz held firm, however, and maintained that the Polish army was no longer capable of effective resistance. No moves further east than was necessary were to be permitted. The next day, the headquarters of 19th Corps and one of its divisions was moved to the east of 3rd Army's operational area and began to put together a provisional task force to command the troops allocated to the move on Lomza. In the corridor, and along the Vistula, more contacts were opened up between 3rd and 4th Army. Meanwhile, the other headquarters units of the Army Group moved forward as their troops pressed ever further into Poland. Army Group HQ was moved to Allenstein in East Prussia, where it remained for the rest of the campaign. 3rd Army HQ was shifted to a point in the frontier region south of Allenstein, and that of 4th Army to a position northwest of Wydgazitz. For the purpose of the next move, the 21 Corps, which had taken Grudziatz, was moved back into East Prussia and concentrated on the river Pizia, which runs south across the frontier into the Nehru. From here it was to prepare for an advance on Lomza. This move represented a shifting eastwards of the 3rd Army's effort, and it was hoped that it would draw the attention of Polish units in the north of the capital to this area, while Gugadarian's 19th Corps units were brought east. The 21 Corps was temporarily augmented by the attachment of 10th Panzer and a brigade of fortress troops, and renamed Group Falkenhorst after its commander. There was some worry that the force committed, which consisted of one Panzer and one infantry division and a brigade of second-line East Prussian fortress troops, was too weak to perform its mission. Nonetheless, Falkenhorst embarked on his mission on the 7th with the 10th Panzer in the lead. Same day, the headquarters of 19th Corps arrived in East Prussia, along with Guderian and the 20th Motorized Infantry Division, first of the mechanized units to make the transfer. For the purposes of the coming operation, the Corps was detached from the 4th Army and taken under the direct control of Army Group Command. The decision was made to begin the drive to envelop the capital without waiting for the remaining divisions of the 19th Corps. Instead, the 10th Panzer and the East Prussian Reserve Brigade were detached from Group Falkenhorst and added to Kadarian's command. Falkenhorst's command had become hung up on the fortified position of Noagorod, on the junction of the Nehru and Pizia rivers, and had not advanced very far, so the move was made quickly. On the 9th, preparations for the attack were complete, and Kadarian's force began its move south. Group Falkenhorst, having lost its attached units, reverted to its previous designation of 21 Corps, and continued the slow advance along the river in the direction of Lomza. Guderian's command, led by the 10th Panzer, crossed the Nehru at Wisna on the same day. 20th Motorized, following closely behind, forced a crossing of the same river a short distance to the west of the tanks. The Corps was ordered to continue south and cross the Bug with the aim of heading off Polish forces retreating eastwards. High command restrictions on the movements of the mechanized forces hampered this maneuver, and the line that they were forbidden to cross was moved some distance eastwards, to a point which would facilitate a link-up with Army Group South sources to the east of the Vistula. The new line was still considered by Army Group North Command to allow too narrow a margin of effectively envelop the greater part of the Poles, but the High Command held firm. The new German attack met its first serious opposition on the 10th, when the 20th motorized and counter troops of the Polish 18th Infantry, other units of which were still engaged near Noagrod. Mobile troops ran into them at Zambro and became embroiled in an intense battle near that town. Nearby elements of the 10th Panzer were diverted to assist, and with their intervention crushed the stubborn resistance of the Poles. While the situation was being dealt with, the other elements of 10th Panzer penetrated to the river Nurzik, a tributary of the Bug, on the approach to the town of Bielsk. As they advanced, they were joined by units of the 3rd Panzer Division, another 19th Corps unit which had completed its movement to the new front and rejoined Guderian's command. While this was going on, the remaining elements of 3rd Army, that is, 1st Corps and Corps Roderig, pushed across the narrow river and were across the bug on the 10th. They were directed to push south, with the intention of cutting off the retreat of Polish units reported to be withdrawing eastwards from the direction of the capital. The moves of these units completed the eastern claw of the German pincer around the capital, which now had the northward arc around Warsaw surrounded. 
The 3rd Army HQ moved up that same day, and occupied the fortified zone at Malawa. These advances forced the Germans to accept serious risks in order to retain their former momentum. The frequent moves of headquarters units to keep up with the frontline troops played havoc with the ground wire telephone communications networks employed by the German commanders, compelling a heavy reliance on radio to communicate intelligence and orders. Needless to say, this is much less secure, and a less disorganized opponent than the Polish army could have potentially exploited this weakness. The confusion prevailing in the Polish organization also saved the Germans from a more serious threat. As 3rd and 4th Army moved ahead, they often maneuvered with completely open flanks, or with their flanks very lightly guarded. The southward advance of the 19th Corps in this phase of the attack is a prime example, as the left flank of this force, facing east, is very exposed to attack from the relatively intact forces to the east in the direction of Bialystok. The Panzer commanders gambled that the disruption of the Polish military was sufficient to limit their ability to carry out a well-directed counterattack. The fact of total German air supremacy, which allowed the Luftwaffe to keep the movements of the Poles under close watch, limited the need to guard against surprise, while the quick-responding, accurate bombing and strafing of dive bombers and close support planes could act in itself as a flank guard. This use of attack aircraft as a substitute for more conventional flank screening force was effective in these circumstances. These tactics would also be used five years later on the other side of the world by the United States, who used continuous patrols of Marine Corps dauntless dive bombers to guard the open flanks of U.S. troops from Japanese counterattacks during the conquest of the Philippines. The actions of Army Group North had resulted in the pushing of the remnants of the Polish armies to the northwest and to a pocket around Kutno and a smaller group to the west of Warsaw. The troops trapped here were almost entirely encircled and cut off from reinforcement and supply. The situation of these poles was made worse by the 3rd Army advances to the east of the capital, which threatened to cut off escape from that quarter as well. On the 12th, Army Group North was ordered to complete the envelopment with part of its forces, and 1st Corps was ordered to execute this maneuver, turning west towards the capital and advancing to seize the river crossings and approaches to the city. Corps Roderig and the other elements of 3rd Army were to continue their advance in a line running through the towns of Garvelin and Sedlice, facing southeast. Meanwhile, 19 Corps would push east past the Bug, seizing Brzezesk and securing the left flank of the advance to the southeast. 19 Corps would be joined on the eastern flank by the rest of 4th Army, which was a disengage in the forces in the Kutno pocket and head east to assume responsibility for operations in the direction of Bialystok. 21 Corps was attached to 4th Army for this operation. Responsibility for the reduction of the Poles at Kutno was assigned to 8th Army, which was pressing up from the south. German intelligence, at this point in the battle, was informed that large numbers of Polish units had managed to cross to the east of the Vistula, and were intending to establish a new defensive line along the rivers of southeastern Poland. The Polish government and high command were reported to have fled the capital and established themselves behind this river line in the fortified city of Lvov. On the basis of this assessment, they concluded that a further major offensive would be required to defeat the Poles unless this new defense line could be broken before it was fully organized. 14th Army of Army Group South had already been ordered to extend its pursuit of the Poles to the area of Lublin and Lvov to carry out an encirclement with Polish forces that managed to escape to the east of the Vistula. 19th Corps, which by now had been rejoined by the 2nd Motorized Division, was directed to cooperate with this movement from the south and execute a second major envelopment of the forces to the southeast before the defense line there could be solidified. On the 12th, they set out on this mission, by now consisting of the 3rd and 10th Panzer Divisions as well as the 2nd and 20th Motorized Infantry. They moved out in two columns, one of tanks on the left, led by 10th Panzer, and the other of Motorized Infantry on the right, led by the 20th. Once again, the eastern flank, to the left of the advancing tanks, was left totally exposed. Polish forces of the Nehru group between Grodno and Bialystok to the northeast caused some concern during the shifting of 4th Army units to their new front. Had the Poles mounted an attack while the major units were in transit, the roads would have been so clogged as to have constituted a serious hindrance to the German defense. However, these units did not mount any significant attack during this dangerous period. Polish resistance in the area of the capital was beginning to crumble. First Corps pushed the Poles out of the area just to the east of the city and on the 16th was laying siege to the suburb of Praga. Corps Roderig, meanwhile, was advancing southward and had captured 8,000 prisoners by the 15th. Soon after it encountered the survivors of the units that had escaped across the Vistula from the Radome pocket to the south and completed their destruction. The German Cavalry Brigade, which had been on the left of Corps Roderig, prevented any further escape across the river in this sector by patrolling the crossings. By the 16th, the Allystock to the northeast had fallen to the Germans. 
Fourth Army's new front to the east had been made secure as far as Bielsk, about 70 miles to the east of the Nehru, and the threat to the left flank of the advance had been eliminated. Even before this, however, forward units of 10th Panzer had pushed on ahead to Brzezesk, sometimes called Brest, a strongly fortified town situated on the Bug River, about 100 miles due east of Warsaw, while 3rd Panzer covered the eastward flank of this advance. Guderian hurried east to join his corps as they reached this important objective. 20th Motorized was also diverted to Brzezesk to participate in the assault. The initial German attack broke into the city's system of bunkers and fortifications, and as the Germans pushed past the outer defenses, the garrison retreated to the heavier works at the city's core. An attempt to take the inner citadel by surprise coup de main failed, and the attack was broken off. Heavier forces would need to be brought to bear. The attack was resumed on the 16th, through the combined effort of the 20th Motorized and 10th Panzer that overcame part of the city's defenses. At a critical stage in the assault on the main positions, however, part of the Panzer Division's infantry component was repulsed, having been unable to follow up quickly enough on a preliminary bombardment of the Poles to their front. The inner citadel thus remained in Polish hands, and would not fall until the next day when the garrison tried to break out of the fortress and attempt to escape towards the west. They ran into a regiment of the 20th Motorized Infantry, and were finally defeated. 600 of Brzez's defenders remained to go into German captivity. While these two divisions were prosecuting the reduction of this town, 3rd Panzer and 2nd Motorized advanced eastwards and southwards along the left flank, generally heading in the directions of Kobrin to the east and Lodola to the southeast. These two divisions would continue to round up scattered Polish units and stragglers making for the east, and captured numerous prisoners. They continued on to seize the towns, while the other two divisions of 19 Corps remained at Brzezesk. At this point, the Corps was placed back under 4th Army Command, and other elements of which, including the attached 21 Corps, had pressed northeastwards and secured the bialystok bielsk region. From the south, 2nd Panzer, part of Army Group South, was approaching Lodola, completing the eastern encirclement. The capture of Brzezesk and the towns on the left flank marked the termination of 19th Corps operations. The Germans' units were by now in some places east of the line that had marked the beginning of the zone allocated to the Soviets by the German-Soviet agreement regarding Poland earlier in the year. Corps HQ was moved up to the newly captured fortress town, and preparations were made to meet the Russians, who had meanwhile crossed their own Polish frontier and were on the way west. Meanwhile, the outlying divisions of 19 Corps were drawn from Kobrin and elsewhere and sent back to join the others at Brzezesk, which was just west of the demarcation line, where they made themselves ready to leave Poland and return to East Prussia. The Red Army had invaded the reeling Poles from the east on the 17th, and the movement of the Soviets westward to meet the Germans both doomed any remaining hopes for the Poles and brought an end to the second phase of German operations in the north. German Army High Command directed Wehrmacht units to withdraw behind a line drawn roughly through Bialystok southwards through Brzezesk and along the Bug River. The appearance of the Russians on the Polish battlefield led to a number of clashes between them and the Germans. An example in the northern theater is provided by a Soviet Air Force strike on the area of Bialystok, which hit a bridge and killed several Germans. In the area just east of the Bug, Russian planes bombed the forward elements of 19 Corps. Despite these incidents, little friction manifested itself between the two invading armies. The major strategic goal of the German operation, the rapid destruction of the Polish military, had been largely achieved by this second phase of operations. In the area of Army Group North responsibility, Polish armies had either been destroyed or encircled and rendered helpless. Junction with Army Group South had been affected to the east of the Vistula, and the capital was invested on all sides. Large forces were shut up in the capital, and much of Army Group North's heavy artillery was occupied with the reduction of the garrison at Modlin, a fortified city a short distance down the Vistula from the capital. As the Russians moved in to take over the areas east of the demarcation line, the Germans in the north gathered their forces for a third and final phase of operations in the north, involving the reduction of the remaining Polish forces and the capture of the capital. So now let's turn to the south and see what Rundstedt's army group south was doing in these vital ten days. The three armies of this formation made rapid gains after the 7th. So quickly were the Germans pressing ahead that a parachute attack to take the crossings of the Vistula at Palau was deemed unnecessary and cancelled. As in the north, headquarters units found themselves faced with the need to shift forward frequently to remain with their formations, with attendant complications of command and control. On the 7th, 8th Army was approaching the city of Lodz, and was in heavy combat with the forces of the Lodz and Formosa armies still in front of the city. Forces of the 10th Army reached Konski on the 9th, and began to gather themselves for the assault on the Poles gathered at Radom. On the right flank of the Army Group's advance, 14th Army pushed past Krakow and advanced north and east, 
while its mobile formations pursued the retreating Poles making for the area of Lublin and Lvov. As the armies fought their way forward, Army Group Headquarters was moved up to the town of Kielce, where it would remain from the 13th until the end of the campaign. Three armies in the south found themselves involved in a series of separate battles as they pushed back the Poles. The overall goal of the German strategy was to attempt to cut off the retreat of the east-moving Polish forces, encircle them, and then complete their destruction. Let's look at the armies in turn, keeping in mind that these actions were developing simultaneously with those of the other southern armies as well as those in the north. We'll begin with 8th Army, on the left or northern sector of the group's front. This infantry force had been considerably augmented by the addition of two corps from the 10th Army, the 11th and 16th. These units were deployed on the right flank of the army. The 16th Corps included the 1st and 4th Panzer Divisions, and these pressed the advance towards Lod. On the 8th, the 4th was on the outskirts of the capital, while the 1st was on the Vistula. The main force of the army was pushing forward against the retreating Lod's army in heavy combat. The excess of these operations against the Polish force exposed the army to the risk of a counterstroke on its northern flank. You may remember from the previous episode that the 8th Army's front to the north opposing the Polish Poznan army, was dangerously extended by the eastward advance. Ten Corps, the northernmost component of 8th Army, was forced to hold a larger and larger front. They had been bolstered during the first phase of the advance by an infantry division from the Army Group Reserve, 213th, and a force of reserve and border troops designated Group Gynath, which helped shore up the weakened flank. The situation was only exacerbated by the further advances to the northeast, and another division from the reserve, the 221st Infantry, was assigned to aid 10 Corps in holding this front. One of the Corps divisions, the 30th Infantry, was holding a front 20 miles or more than 30 kilometers in length. On the 10th, this division was indeed hit by a Polish counterattack from forces of the Poznan Army to the north. This assault was estimated to include two or three Polish infantry divisions and two brigades of cavalry. In response, the 8th Army Command directed 10th Corps to turn its front to the north and repel the Polish attack. The 30th Infantry, on whom the brunt of the attack fell, was pushed back some distance by the Poles, but the units here regrouped and in combination with other northern flank forces established a new line and held the attack the next day. Anti-tank, artillery, and other units were rushed to the scene, while the newly attached 11th Corps from 10th Army was diverted to assist the defense and struck the Poles from the eastern flank of their penetration. This Polish attack inflicted considerable losses on the German units here, especially the 30th Infantry. However, the Poles were soon repulsed and pushed back hastening their encirclement in the pocket developing around Kutno. The intervention of the 11th Corps especially succeeded in forcing the Poles to retreat to the west of the river Bezura, from which escape in the direction of Warsaw or Maudlin would be impossible. On the 11th, the city of Lodz was in German hands, and 8th Army moved its HQ there. This army was directed to prosecute the reduction of the Poles trapped in the Kutno region. The next day, 3rd Corps was transferred from 4th Army to the 8th, and Army Group North transferred the rest of the 4th Army to its thrust east of the capital. The plan was for the Germans here to press in from the west, south, and east against the barrier of Army Group North's forces blocking escape across the Vistula to the north. A major portion of the surviving Polish troops in the western half of the country were trapped in the pocket, including elements of the Poznan, Lodz, and Pomoza armies. This included 12 infantry divisions and three brigades of cavalry. All told, more than one-third of the remaining Polish army was surrounded there, under the command of a Poznan army commander, General Bortnowski. The reduction of this pocket, representing the partial success of the high command plan to destroy the Poles west of the Vistula, would become the major focus of the campaign over the next few days. The enlarged 8th Army deployed 6th Corps under its command for this operation in an arc between the Bezura and Vistula rivers. Poles, realizing their plight, made a strong attempt to break out to the southeast. With the aid of Luftwaffe strikes and artillery this attempt was held, with the loss of some ground by the Germans. Polish attacks served to exhaust their resistance, however, and their units, few of which remained even partially intact, remained trapped in the patch of land between the rivers under constant attack. On the 16th, a final breakout attempt was mounted, and the Poles made a desperate attempt to fight their way through the German lines, this time across the river Vistula and towards the fortress zone of Modlin. This failed, and the Germans pushed the defeated Polish attackers back further and further, herding the remaining troops in the pocket into a compact mass, perfect target for massed air attack. The next day, the bombers of the Luftwaffe, which had been striking the Poles holding out in Warsaw, were set upon these densely tacked troops. A final German attack coupled with this tremendous aerial bombardment broke the last defense of the Poles, and the pocket collapsed. In the chaos of the final battles here, 
A strong force of determined Poles managed to fight its way through the oncoming Germans and break free. These troops made a run for the heavily forested area to the southwest of Modlin, south of the Vistula. They immediately ran into oncoming troops of the 10th Army and were all but annihilated. Something like 40,000 Poles surrendered at Kutno and went into German captivity, many of them never to emerge. For the remainder of the second phase of operations, 8th Army was engaged in clearing out the last Polish holdouts in this area. When we last left 10th Army, the largest of the three, and in the center of Army Group's south sector, its mechanized elements, the strongest of which were concentrated in Hopner's 16th Corps, were advancing straight on the capital. The Poles, their defenses shattered after the breaking of their fortified lines in Silesia, around Katowice and Chestachewa, were throwing in the divisions of their general reserve in an attempt to reform a defensive line against the oncoming Wehrmacht motorized forces. As in the advances in the north, Brunstedt's armored forces pushed ever further ahead, probing for weaknesses in the Polish defenses. Stubborn points of resistance were surrounded and bypassed, or compelled to abandon their positions due to the threat of encirclement. With the advanced formations rode Luftwaffe officers who would direct dive bombers and ground attack planes on strong points or counter-attack forces, breaking up or knocking out anything too tough for the tanks to handle themselves. Other Polish forces in less important locations were trapped and held for the slower-moving infantry and artillery troops marching up behind the panzers to destroy and systematic clearing operations. The momentum of this advance prevented Polish attempts to organize a new defensive line. The Lodz Army, under attack from the 8th Army, was compelled by the advance of 10th Army's tanks along the north bank of the Pilika River to withdraw in the direction of Kutno. This left only the Polish forces who had withdrawn into the area of Radom to propose the 10th. Here the Poles had gathered six infantry divisions and a brigade of cavalry, drawn from the remnants of the shattered Krakow Army and the General Reserve. These units were crowded in between the Pilika and Vistula rivers, with the advancing Germans pushing them back towards the latter in the east. Of these units, only the 12th Infantry Division, a formation from the General Reserve, had not been heavily engaged with the Germans and was relatively intact. As we have noted in the previous episode, 10th Army was directed to make its major effort against this concentration. The plan called for an envelopment of the pocket from the north and the south, with the Germans capturing the crossings of the Vistula beyond, facilitating their link-up with Army Group North and the completion of the surroundment of Warsaw. As the 11th and 16th Corps were still attached to the 8th Army at this time and participating in the sealing off of the Kutno pocket, the operation would require the efforts of the remaining strength of the 10th. 14th and 15th Corps were assigned the task of pushing ahead the northern and southern arms of the encircling movement, while 4th Corps drove straight in from the west and southwest, driving the Poles back behind an ever-shrinking perimeter on the tongue of land between the two rivers. Envelopment was rapidly accomplished. 14th and 15th Corps reached the Vistula north and south of the trap poles on the 8th. For three days, the Luftwaffe and artillery blasted the defenders, while German ground assaults pressed them ever harder. Polish resistance at Radrome broke finally on the 11th, and the pocket collapsed, yielding an astonishing bag of more than 60,000 prisoners. In the confusion attending the collapse of the defense, a small number of regiment-sized Polish units retained their cohesion and broke out of the trap, fled into the nearby heavily forested areas, where they would continue to resist for a few more days. Crossings of the Vistula were gained, including the vital bridge at Palawi, directly east of Radome and halfway between it and Lublin. Brunstedt ordered the 10th Army to send its 4th Corps across the river and towards its important city. The drive was intended to support the larger movement of 14th Army forces on that same objective, and facilitate the link-up with the eastward enveloping action being carried out by 19th Corps to the north. The other elements of the 10th that had taken part in the reduction of the pocket were to remain west of the Vistula, where they would eliminate the remaining centers of Polish resistance in the area and prevent any further survivors from making their escape. On the 13th, 7th, and 8th Corps were transferred from 14th Army to 10th Army control. The two corps were ordered to advance eastwards and to move on the Polish force holding out at Bilgaraj. This town lay about 20 miles or 35 kilometers east of the sand and about halfway down a line drawn between Lublin and Lvov. The Poles were strongly entrenched here, and two German corps were ordered to encircle this force in support of the movement of the reigning 14th Army troops moving up from the south and southwest. The Polish forces here put up a desperate fight, before long, German corps were involved in heavy combat here. On the 14th, 4th Corps crossed the Vistula and pressed the attack to the small city of Krasnik on the route to Lublin. They drove the Poles out of the town and pushed beyond, continuing east past Lublin to the Wipers River, which ran roughly northwest southeast a dozen miles or so beyond the city. 14th Corps was massing on the west bank of the Vistula, but had not yet crossed, as important portions of its strength were still occupied clearing out the survivors of the Radom Pocket. On the 15th, the 11th, and 16th Corps 
which had been operating with 8th Army against Kutno, were reattached to the 10th Army. The resumption of control of these units put 10th Army on two fronts, the one towards Lublin to the east and that on the north facing Warsaw. The two corps, on the right flank of the army, were to advance north and invest the capital from the south, completing the encirclement. They were directed to send some of their armor into the region between Warsaw and Kutno to protect the flanks of the two armies as they moved in on the surrounded enemy. They held an east-west line to the south of Warsaw, barring an approach to the city. 11th Corps, nearest the Kutno pocket, was given a greater number of troops and established bridgeheads across the Bezura River, from which they could assault this pocket from the east. This was accomplished on the 16th, and two panzer divisions from the 16th Corps were moved up to attack across the river. However, on this day the Poles mounted their last breakout attempt, and this prevented the panzers from going in. Two infantry divisions were moved to deal with the Polish move, while the panzers were held in blocking positions between Kutno and the capital to deal with enemy units that managed to break out. Though the Polish attempt disrupted the planned attack, the power of Polish resistance here was basically broken by his defeat. The following day came the heavy air attacks and the 8th Army ground assault that finally caused the Kutno pocket to collapse. As we have noticed before, a few Polish units valiantly fought their way out of the encirclement in the confusion of the final assault. Most of these were survivors of the now defunct Poznan Army. They ran into troops of the 11th and 16th Corps to the west of Warsaw and were defeated. Something like 12,000 prisoners were taken in this action. Meanwhile, the troops on 10th Army's eastern front were still advancing. A major success was scored when Lublin fell on the 17th. Street fighting would continue in the city for several days after. Mobile units pressed past the city and reached the Rupers River beyond on the same day. To the south, the town of Bilgaraj also fell after heavy fighting. Though Polish forces remained in the field to the southeast of the town, capture of these positions, the major objectives of 10th Army in the second phase of operations were accomplished. Forces continued to press on across the Wipers eastwards to the city of Chelm, and the rest of 10th Army in the east was moving to occupy its sector up to the Russian demarcation line, which in this case ran mostly along the Bug River. Meanwhile, 10th Army HQ was moved into the vicinity of Warsaw, and the forces of its two corps there pressed northwards onto the besieged capital. Further south, the forces of 14th Army were pressing eastwards. On the 10th, the 17th, and 18th Corps reached the banks of the Sand River to the north and south of Przemysl. Here they met the Polish 24th Division, a formation from the General Reserve, and forces who would draw eastwards. The Germans were across the river the same day. Elements of the Polish 11th Infantry, survivors of the Krakow Army, were encountered in this action, and these were also compelled to retreat into the city, where they were shut up. The two corps then pressed on eastwards for their objective, the city of Lwów. Task Force under Colonel Scherner of the 1st Mountain Division, part of the 18th Corps, was the first to reach the defenses of the city. Once there, the mountain troops invested the city and cut it off from the forces remaining in the Przemysl area. The fortifications of the city housed a garrison of some 12,000 men, and the Polish High Command had relocated there not long before in hopes of organizing a renewed defensive effort in the southeastern portion of the country. Scherner's troops met determined resistance to their initial probing attacks. The city was dominated by a series of ridges to the north and northeast, known as the Zaboyska Heights. This high ground would have to be taken early, while the escape routes running south and southeast of the city would need to be barred. At the same time, possible threats would have to be countered, mainly from the troops of Przemysl and those retreating towards the area from the southwest. This latter threat, to which the entire right flank of the division was exposed, could become serious. Scherner's task group went into the attack at 10 hundred hours on September 13th. Their initial target was the Dzeboiska Heights. The mountain troops made good progress throughout the day, reaching an important position known as Hill 374 in the afternoon. From this commanding height, they pressed their advantage and captured the town of Zaboiska, cutting the major route to the north. By dark, the surrounding ridges were secure. During the night, the Germans dug in and held their gains against furious Polish counterattacks, which failed to dislodge them. Other 18th Corps units moved to block the route from the southwest and hurried around the city to bar the escape routes to the south and east. Slower progress was made on the left flank of the army, where the German 7th and 8th Corps were, were opposed by the Polish 21st and 22nd Mountain Divisions and the Rizal Armored Cavalry Brigade. These units retained their cohesion and put up an excellent rearguard defense. As a result, both of these corps were engaged in clearing the Poles from the area north of the junction of the Vistula and the San. Poles were able to get across the river in good order, and withdrew to the northeast, headed for the densely wooded and swampy areas in the vicinity of Balgaraj. On the 13th, the 14th Army was directed to send the rest of its 18th Corps to take Lvov. Once the city fell, this corps was to turn northwards. 
They would be joined by the 17th and 22nd Corps in the center section of the Army sector, and together they would advance to the northeast, with the aim of effecting a junction with the forces of Army Group North to the east of the Bug. At the same time, the 7th and 8th Corps, still on the west side of the San, were transferred to 10th Army control. This left the entirety of the 14th Army committed to operations deep into eastern Poland. To better control this southern jaw of the more easterly pincer movement, the Armour's HQ was moved up to Rizal, or about 65 kilometers west of Przemysl, and not far from the westerly bend of the San. The Russian demarcation line, which was furthest east in the south, was just east of Lvov, hence the order for 18th Corps to move north after taking the city. The advance would take it along the demarcation line, towards the junction with Army Group North forces somewhere in the vicinity of Kelm. Everywhere in the 14th Army area, only disorganized resistance was encountered. The exceptions were the forces holed up at Przemysl and Lvov, to the northeast of Lvov, and near Belgaraj. By the 14th, all of these forces were heavily engaged and the cities were closely invested. Przemysl fell soon after, despite a fierce resistance that necessitated pulling units drawn from several other divisions from other tasks in order to prosecute the assault on the city's defenses. Lvov, however, withstood the German siege so far, and its protected resistance led to the dispatch of armored and mechanized forces to the city after the clearing of the area east of Przemysl. These mobile troops were intended to intercept Polish units still attempting to reach the city from the southwest. Some were also sent south to secure the oil-producing area near the city and prevent the escape of Polish troops into Romania. Poles mounted an attack on the northern part of the German investment of the fortress city in an attempt to relieve the garrison. These attacks fell mostly upon Schoener's 1st Mountain Division, which still held the heights there. The Polish attempts were foiled, but at a cost of heavy losses to the mountain troops. This would be the situation in the area when the Red Army intervention came on the 17th. As a result of this, German forces in the area were barred from any further movement eastwards, and the area was secured while the siege of Lvov continued and heavy fighting went on in the area around Bilgarage. These operations concluded the second phase of German operations in Poland. The intervention of the Red Army ended all hope of Polish resistance. The aims of the German war plan had been by and large achieved by this point. The field forces of the Polish army had been destroyed or rendered incapable of operations. In two huge encircling movements, five German armies had trapped the remaining Poles in helpless pockets from which they could only temporarily resist destruction. A third and final phase of operations would continue for the remainder of the month of September. This consisted of two major actions. The first was the evacuation of German forces from the designated Russian zone to the east. These were allowed time to complete whatever ongoing mission they were engaged in and, by and large, withdrew without incident. The other, and much more terrible, was the destruction of the remaining Polish troops holed up in the fortress cities and trapped in the isolated pockets, including the major forces left in the capital. These operations were more or less repetitions of the actions against the Kutno and Radom pockets. Intensive air and artillery bombardment accompanied by siege and constant attacks by the surrounding armies ground down the resistance. Unlike the operations against the two pockets in which the major portion of the Polish army had been eliminated, however, the reduction of the capital and the fortress cities was complicated by the presence of thousands upon thousands of civilians. These miserable people would be far from the last innocent European city dwellers to have the panoply of modern industrial warfare brought to bear against them. The situation in the capital was further exacerbated, in terms of international reaction, by the German disregard of the customary rights of the diplomatic colony of the nations present in the Polish capital, who were not permitted to leave and suffered the horrors of the battle along with the rest of the unfortunates in the city. The shattered capital fell on the 29th, and the Germans moved into the ruins, which would be theirs for the next five years. The final Polish holdouts in the far north, along the Baltic coast, were near the ports of Gdynia and Hidla. The latter of these was the last Polish unit to surrender, and it did so on the 1st of October. The Republic of Poland, which had existed for barely 20 years, was extinguished, and the Polish nation once more submerged and transformed in the provinces of foreign empires. The conquests had brought more than two and a half million people under Nazi control. Three quarters of a million of these were ethnic Germans, and thus liable to conscription. German casualties for the campaign amounted to just over 8,000 officers and men killed, and another 33,000 or so wounded and missing in action. They lost 217 tanks, most of them the lighter Panzer I and II models. About 400 aircraft were also lost. Almost all of the German equipment had been through very heavy use, and the planes and vehicles were all in need of overhaul and repair. The Poles suffered much more heavily, of course. German sources reported 694,000 prisoners taken. 
This left something like 110,000 who were killed, went missing, captured by the Russians, or fled into neighboring Romania and Hungary. In terms of equipment, the Germans captured more than 3,000 guns, 16,500 machine guns, 1,700 mortars, and large quantities of small arms and ammunition. Most of this captured ordnance was deemed unsuitable for German use and was given to German client states in Eastern Europe and elsewhere. And so that is where I'm going to conclude our look at the German invasion of Poland. I hope you found some of this interesting and useful. The treatment of this invasion in this U.S. Army study really highlights what the Americans, at least, concluded was the key to German victory in Poland. A commitment of the great majority of their forces to a quick and violent campaign, and the extensive preparations taken in terms of logistics and in providing the necessary supporting services, such as the provision of large numbers of construction and engineering troops to support 10th Army's drive, in anticipation of an insufficient Polish transportation infrastructure. Also emphasized were the frequent shifts of German headquarters units to remain near the troops under their control, and the reassignment of corps and division level units between the armies to better exploit unexpected opportunities or to reinforce a weak point. Finally, study points out that despite all these extensive preparations, the Germans had to run great risks and heavily exploit their command of the air to manage the potentially disastrous situations in order to maintain the pace of the advance. Next time we're going to return to Spain for our subject matter, but we won't be looking at the civil war there, and instead we'll focus on events that took place in the Moroccan protectorate in the previous decade. I'm referring to what is usually called the Rif War. In particular, we're going to focus on the role of the Tercio de Exchangeros, which was the Spanish Foreign Legion, a unit that was created to fight in this colonial campaign. The ethos of this crack unit would shape the young and rising officers of the Spanish army, more ambitious of which would figure prominently in its ranks and whose outlook and tactical experience would be forged in the vicious and hard-fought actions in the arid highlands of the rock and colony. So I hope you'll join me for that. Till then, I hope this week brings you all that you wish from it, and that you and yours continue safe and happy as we plow through what let's hope proves to be the hectic portion of the early 21st century. Till then, I remain Mark Seven, wishing you all the best.